Now how about we do some scripture readings from the Book of Mormon? Ah, yes, family home evening, a activity that I spent quite a bit of time doing growing up, (laughs) which is being featured here in this South Park episode called All About the Mormons. This South Park episode was put out in 2003. I, of course, heard about this cartoon growing up, but I definitely never watched it because I knew that South Park was a cartoon for adults. Some people said that this episode was anti-Mormon, and so I definitely never watched this as an active member. Even the language in the episode or in South Park in general alone would keep me from watching something like this. But I did watch this one time eight years ago, right when I first left the church. Some people suggested it to me and my husband who were in the process of leaving. And so today I'm watching it again for the second time. I will say I've learned a lot of Mormon history since then. And so I am so excited to give you my ex-Mormon hot take on the South Park episode all about the Mormons. I will also be reacting to a video that an active Mormon did several years ago where she, as a believer, is reacting. So we're going to have a little bit of my reaction and a little bit of my reaction to the reaction. Before we jump in, just a reminder to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and drop a comment below about your reaction or if you have any of your own favorite Mormon pop culture references that you want to share with everyone in the comments. We have a new student joining us today who has just moved here from Utah. I love that Gary is blonde because the Mormon stereotype is definitely all Mormons are very white and blonde people from Utah. I'm really excited to live in this town and share all kinds of great experiences with you, my new friends. In in the Mormon reaction video, she reminds us that not all Mormons are from Utah. And that's very a very common defense about Utah Mormons is that it's a worldwide church and there are more members outside of the United States than in it. But ultimately, the highest concentration of Mormons is still in Utah. That's where they fled after Joseph Smith died. And as much as Mormons don't like that stereotype, if you ever visit Utah, there is a Mormon chapel on every single block. Maybe he won't fight. Oh, I get it. I'm the new kid. I love this nice Mormon kid stereotype too. Not only is he from Utah, he's perfect. He got straight A's. He's an athlete and he's also so nice. In this interview I found with the creators of South Park, they said that they are atheists who don't hate religion, who are kind of fascinated by it and kind of admire it. And that definitely comes through that Mormons hold a very special place in the hearts of the creators of South Park. I mean, so far they've only portrayed this little boy in the most positive light imaginable. So now that I'm getting into it, I honestly can't remember too much. I mean, I watched this episode like eight years ago. I am curious to see if the kindness though is going to be a pretext for sharing the Mormon gospel. (laughs) Okay, my turn. Ooh, five. I love that they're playing a board game in this. Uh, Board games are like the foundation of Mormon childhood culture. I played... I played so many board games growing up. Uh, Settlers of Catan was a really popular one and not just board games, card games. Like I played apples to apples constantly in college, which is so funny. You know, I'm sure the average viewer in an American college experience was not playing uh, apples to apples at most parties, uh, but that was my college experience. And they're just so wholesome. But even just the laughter, the laughter of the family, they're all, it's just, so wholesome but I love but I love the contrast between the Mormon family and everyone else where the wholesomeness is almost eerie because it doesn't seem real well it's great you could join us for family home evening Stan so many kids and of course they are all of course they're all musicians. Music is so such a huge part of Mormon culture. It's funny to me too because this little family looks like they're going to be influencers. You know, 2003 before this episode, you know, that was kind of before the influencer era of social media. But this family now would be would have a million followers because there's 20 kids, you know, there's not literally 20 kids, but there's a ton of kids and the the family is so smiling and happy and a family like this is like the pre this is 2003 pre-internet social media family right here doing all of their little instruments they uh, are playing in a play they're playing board games they're so fun they're so wholesome this is like a crash course in why there are so many mormon influencers all right go dave (laughs) we'll be 
York vibes now. So interesting because they get so much of the culture right. When I would do family home evening growing up, we would do something called talent shows. And in my family, so family home evening is usually every Monday. And we always had some sort of activity. There was always a treat like cookies. Uh, we always did, you know, the activity would be a board game or something. We might do, like I said, the talent show where we all show off our various talents. Mine would be, you know, gymnastics. My sister was good at flute, an instrument. So this is spot on to my lived experience as a Mormon growing up. So far, besides the unfavorable language, uh, I feel like this is not anti-Mormon, but we'll see. <laughs> now how about we do some scripture readings from the Book of Mormon? Amazing. I it, This is so spot on too, uh, that the kindness and the happiness is so, so often a pretext for missionary work. Here they are having a great time, but it's all pointing to, it's all leading up to this wonderful opportunity to share the gospel. As a Mormon kid, I always carried a Book of Mormon with me. I invited my friends to church dances. I invited guys that I was dating who weren't members to church. You know, it's all so much of the friendliness and kindness is meant to almost open the door. As a Mormon missionary, you're taught to go be really friendly and compliment their home and ask about their kids and, you know, say their kids are so cute. It's all basically smoke and mirrors that are just trying to get your heart to be opened so that they can introduce you to the Book of Mormon and to Joseph Smith. Who's Joseph Smith? <laughs> Only the most important person in the world. So there's a Mormon girl who did a reaction video to this episode. And here is what she has to say about that line about how Joseph Smith is the most important guy in the world. Not true. He's not the most important person in the world. That is Jesus Christ. For sure, we do not worship Joseph Smith. <laughs> we do not worship Joseph Smith. Please open the hymn book to the hymn Praise to the Man, which is about Joseph Smith and about praising him, which I suppose she might write off as saying compliments to him. But if you read the lyrics, praise to the man who communed with Jehovah, Jesus anointed that prophet and seer. Kings shall extol him and nations revere. Hail to the prophet ascended to heaven. Hail to the prophet ascended to heaven certainly doesn't sound like they do don't worship him to me. There's also a much loved quote about Joseph Smith that I heard constantly growing up that says it's from the Doctrine and Covenants, which is Mormon scripture. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man who has ever lived in it. So as much as she says, you know, we don't worship Joseph Smith, there's certainly a lot of worship adjacent language around Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was called a prophet. Dum, 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 dum. I have such a funny memory of this dumb, 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 uh, because in high school, there was a guy who sometimes when I would be talking about my faith, if the Mormonism of the Book of Mormon and everything, he would he would sing that to me. Dum, 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 dum. And I just thought he was being silly. I, you know high school guys, like silly, whatever, you know, those rascals. Uh, but I, when I watched this for the first time and now I just think it's so funny that he watched this episode. He was a high school boy watching South Park and he was saying dumb, like D-U-M-B obviously is what they're getting at here is that this whole thing is dumb. Uh, but he would say that to me and whew, over my head, um, obviously. And then in this Mormon reaction video from this girl, I watched the whole thing. She never um, catches on to the dum, 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 dum. I think I was basically like Gary in South Park where I'm just like, wow, someone's listening to me share about my faith. This is the most wonderful moment of my life. <gasps> dum, 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 dum. You know, it's so funny. And suddenly God and Jesus appeared before me and they said I should start my own church. This is great. They they use the exact Mormon line here, which is uh, they're, they're presenting, obviously, which is the story Joseph Smith taught, the, the approved narrative. Uh, they don't, you know, in this episode, obviously, they don't get into all of the history, but the truth is that Joseph Smith 
Nobody knew about this first vision until over a decade after he said it happened. He said this happened when he was 14. Uh, he didn't speak a word of it till after the Book of Mormon was published and after he was a well-known prophet. You see? You believe it now? Well, yeah, sure. Why would he make that up? Oh, my gosh. Why would he make it up? He later had 30 wives. But why would he make it up? He later became known across the country and had thousands of followers. But why would he make it up? I am Moroni. I am a Native American. But your skin is white. <laughs> wow. There's so much to unpack here. And what I love about it is that a Mormon watches this and says, yeah, that basically checks out. <laughs> That's what we believe. What I love about this is that South Park doesn't even need to embellish the story for the average viewer to just say, what? The, the Native American is white? Uh, the most remarkable thing I think about Joseph Smith is the fact that people believed him. The Book of Mormon, which I have one right here, is a, apparently uh, gold plates that a prophet in the Americas buried that, that is a compilation of stories that is a religious text from the Native Americans. Why? <laughs> There's so much context that you have to go into to explain what this even is. And basically that they are ancestors of Israelites who left Jerusalem and they made a craft, a boat that somehow made it all the way across the ocean, landed in the Americas, and that uh, they wrote a record of their religious experiences. And that's what we have today. Let's really quick watch the Mormon reaction to this. This is what she says. <laughs> Of, Moroni, of what Moroni said to him, but I mean, they got the gist. <laughs> I love that she doesn't even register that this whole whiteness thing is weird. You know, she, she and she doesn't explain it either. She explains, you know, where the Book of Mormon came from, why it's important, why she has a testimony of it, but there's never an explanation for the doctrine behind why the angel Moroni is white. First of all, even if they were from Jerusalem, they probably shouldn't be as white as this guy. He looks like Joe Biden to me or some other, I mean, name any white old man. That's who he looks like. But the reason for this whiteness of the Native Americans is because the Book of Mormon teaches that uh, the righteous Native Americans had white skin. They literally call it white and delightsome in the Book of Mormon. Uh, however, when they sin, they become, they have dark skin. And this dark skin in the Book of Mormon is a curse. Uh, when you're sinful, your skin turns dark. And this is part of the original Joseph Smith teaching around race and later Brigham Young is that uh, dark skin is a curse and that black people specifically have the curse of Cain, which is the mark that God put on Cain when the whole Cain and Abel thing went down in the Bible. It's all based in racism that people who are less valiant have dark skin and that's a curse from God. To read where they talk about this in the Book of Mormon is 2 Nephi verse 521. And he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. Before behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Therefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. And so that's why we see, and it's so funny that she doesn't explain why this whiteness is being added as an element to South Park. That's why we see Angel Moroni as white is because he is one of the fair and delightsome people. And so this depiction of Moroni being white is definitely rooted in racism. It's rooted in Joseph Smith's racism, carried on to Brigham Young, later even in the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, the church was opposed to the civil rights movement. Black people were not allowed to have the priesthood. They were not allowed to enter the temple until the late 70s. So I, I think it's so interesting that the Mormon girl doesn't pick up on this racial comment that they've added it as an element here to South Park because ultimately race is very thoroughly intertwined with the history of the Book of Mormon, Native Americans, and Joseph Smith. There is an ancient book buried near here 
written on gold plates that account my people's lives. A quick reminder that all of this is fabricated more than a decade after Joseph Smith said this happened. It's a very uh, imaginative story about where uh, this holy, air quotes, holy book came from. I'm excited to go see Joseph Smith find the Book of Mormon. What happened then? <laughs> oh my gosh i also love how they're depicting sugar in this sugar also known as the only mormon vice uh that now mormons can have caffeine growing up i was told we couldn't have caffeine but uh there was caffeine gate where mitt romney was found you know mitt romney was drinking caffeine and everyone freaked out about it it was when it was when he was running to be you know president and he was found with caffeine and people started saying oh he's a bad mormon because he drinks caffeine and the church released an official statement, I think, just to clear Mitt Romney's name, that caffeine is okay, but coffee is very bad and sinful. So I just love their depiction of sugar here because I had so much sugar growing up all the time in church. You know, cookies, brownies, donuts, you name it, we had it. It's really the only treat you get to have as a Mormon. And I also love that they're going to go pass them out. And I bet, you know, I did this. I passed out sugary treats. I literally did this. I passed out sugary treats to my non-member friends and we would put a little ribbon on the and we'd put a little ribbon with a little note often on these little treats that would have a scripture or would often have like they they have these little cards that say get a free book of mormon delivered to your door hello oh hi stan he goes home and his family doesn't love him like the Mormon family loved him. I do think looking at the, some of the interviews with Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who started South Park, they describe the Book of Mormon musical as an atheist love letter to religion. And that's, I, I think, also what I see here. Uh, I do think, though, I don't love the portrayal purely because I do think, you know, there's a lot of really loving Mormon families. Don't get me wrong. But... Imagine, you know, if one of those kids was gay, that is the, that's the chink in the armor. Or imagine if one of these kids grows up and wants to marry outside of their race. Up until the 70s and early 80s, interracial marriage was taught from the pulpit as being a sin. I, and I, even though I was born in the 90s, I heard growing up that interracial marriage was a sin. And so even if they stopped teaching it from the pulpit, it still is part of the culture. It wasn't until 2013 that the church finally came out and said, we we just about interracial marriage. So, you know, as much as we see this very happy Mormon family, I feel like what's missing and what I think South Park missed out on is the fact that if there is a black sheep, if there is a kid who likes listening to metal music, if there is a, a kid that's gay, if there is a girl who has sex with her boyfriend one time, those children are not fundamentally, in my opinion, loved and accepted in the same way in the church. And so I, I feel like I, I think that they're playing on the stereotype, right, of the very happy Mormon family. But the problem with this stereotype is that if there's a kid that doesn't meet every Mormon rule, if they don't check every Mormon box, they are not part of the family in the same way anymore. And so I'd like to fact check this happy family aspect. You know, every family is happy and unhappy in their own ways. Some families have more issues than others in and out of the church. Even if these parents were to get divorced, that, you know, when, when my parents got divorced, that was a crazy difficult thing for me to go through. And they published my parents' divorce in the ward in the church bulletin. They put it in the little pamphlet they give out and they hand it out to every single member an announcement that my parents got divorced and that that was so sad and hopefully that fate did not happen to anyone else in the congregation. There's this happy smiling Mormon veneer, but if you dig beneath it and ask what about the gay kids? What about the people of color? What about the girls who want to pass the sacrament? What about the women who can't have children? Once you start digging through, if you, if you have a family that falls outside of the biological cisgender nuclear family, there it's not 
this is not what happens. And I think that that's what's missing <laughs> from the South Park episode. I think I, if I was writing this Mormon family, I would have had one kid be the black sheep who was always up in his room and you never see him. He never appears. They just refer to him as the little Johnny who's up in his room and who will not be coming down tonight. There is that there's always going to be somewhere hiding a black sheep that the family doesn't really pull out to play their instrument like they do the other kids. Just a reminder before we continue, just just a reminder before we continue, please like this video, subscribe to my channel if you have an awesome Mormon pop culture reference, because there are actually quite a few of them, please drop it in the comments. If you are someone uh, recovering from Mormonism, you grew up in the church, you're trying to leave and finding it difficult to uh, unravel Mormonism from your human existence, please check out my book, How to Leave the Mormon Church. There's a link in the description below. This is the hardcover version. It took me about two years to write this. It's everything I learned about how to leave the church, not just to leave it, but to leave it and be happy and live a full life after leaving. Wow. Inside the stone box, I found the magical seer stones. Under that, I found four gold plates written in strange writing. Wow, there it is in all its glory, the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> You'll see on the uh, the gold plates, there's writing. Joseph Smith said that that was Reformed Egyptian, which um, <laughs> which linguists say is um, made up language. There's Egyptian, but there's no such thing as Reformed Egyptian. Let's see how our Mormon friend reacted to this moment. All morning, when the angel would told me to look, hmm, uh, maybe there isn't. He didn't have to dig around all morning, guys. The angel directed him where he should go. <laughs> he saw it in, a, in, a, in his dream the night before. <laughs> <laughs> her laughter here and, like, her nonchalance just cracks me up. Uh, she's, she's just so, like, duh, guys. This He knew where they were because an angel told him. This is so silly. It's like this. It's an obvious inability to even see the absurdity of the story itself in that she's trying to correct an absurd story with more absurd facts. But that's how all of belief is, you know, whether you are a Mormon or just a Christian or any religion, uh, it's all based on faith. You know, a, a spirit came down and impregnated a virgin, but not through sex, just through in divine intervention somehow. And the baby she had was a God or God made manifest or the son of God. And then he was crucified. You know, all religious stories are nonsensical. All of them are miraculous or made up whatever you want to call it. And so it's hard to tease her too much because Essentially, all religious belief, if you explain it back to someone with no context, does sound absurd, to be honest. The angel Moroni appeared to me again and said that I am not allowed to show the plates. Obviously, you know, the people at the time also just said, hey, if you can just let us see them, that'll clear things up mighty quick. Uh, but no, he was not allowed to show them the plates. Because first I must translate what's written on the plates into English. Dum 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 dum. Let's listen in to what our Mormon friend has to say about this portion. Okay, that's not true. Other people saw them. Actually, if you guys get a copy of the Book of Mormon, which actually there's a link down below in my description box, if you want a free Book of Mormon, you can have it delivered directly to your door for free. OMG, she's giving us the opportunity to get our very own Book of Mormon. It's almost like everything Mormons do is an excuse to share the gospel. So funny. She is being a missionary within the South Park episode about Mormons being missionaries. This is too meta. If you want a free Book of Mormon, you can have it delivered directly to your door for free. I think this free, 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 free. The funny thing is, is that you, uh, if you take the hook and uh, get hooked into the religion, reeled in, guess how much of your income you have to pay in order to be considered a worthy member? 10%. So, you know, as much as members love to talk about this 
free opportunity to have one delivered to your door for free. Um, well, if they can get one member, that member will give them 10% of their income for the rest of their lives. And that money is tax free. So this little investment of a book to print and missionaries who do it for free to walk it to your door, you know, actually Mormon missionaries pay to serve a mission. It's actually one of the best investment programs imaginable, which is why the Mormon church has over a hundred billion dollars. Um, but anyways, in the Book of Mormon, in the first like two pages of the introduction, there's um, the testimony of the three witnesses and testimony of the eight witnesses. Um, so a total of 11 people actually saw the golden plates and they wrote down their testimony to prove that like, yeah, we actually saw these things. They really exist. And here's our names to go with it. Oh, what a claim. 11 people. I heard this all the time growing up and it's still in the Book of Mormon today. What she's talking about the testimony of the witnesses. This is the testimony of the three witnesses and the eight witnesses. And if you look closely, which I'll put a screenshot here, if you look at the names, you'll see Whitmer, 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 Whitmer. You'll also see Smith, Smith, Smith. So it definitely seems like they're pulling from a fairly small pool to get these witnesses. Um, most of these, some of these witnesses, obviously with the name Smith, were people Joseph Smith was related to by blood. The Whitmers were very close friends. All of these people had a lot of skin in the game to uh, make sure that the Book of Mormon was a success and that Joseph Smith was a prophet. And a lot of money invested in the Book of Mormon too. For example, Martin Harris mortgaged his farm in order to get this printed. So all of them had a very strong motivation for this little project to work out and for all of them to get some notoriety as hitching their wagons to Joseph Smith. Also, many of them later said that they didn't see them with their physical eyes. They saw them with their spiritual eyes. To give some context, I'm reading here from No Man Knows My History. This is a direct quote from one of the three witnesses. Um, one of them was named Martin Harris, and he's being questioned by a lawyer who asked him, did you see the plates and the engravings upon them with your bodily eyes? the eyes in your head, to which he replied, I did not see them as I do that pencil case, yet I saw them as with the eye of faith. I saw them just as distinctly as I see anything around me, though at the time they were covered with a cloth. And so as much as we want, and so as much as members want to say, look at all of these people who saw them, uh, many of them later said they only saw them with spiritual eyes, not their actual physical eyes. And a lot of them had so much skin in the game and money invested that the motive and even that their literal family, it's hard to look at this as an unbiased, you know, grabs people from the street and ask them to look. He's asking his closest confidants and his family members. I think there's something to that religion. That's what they made me think, too. Oh man, there they it worked. It worked. <laughs> uh, this is so funny that they're going to become Mormon. They've been convinced by the big smiles and the the friendly brownies. The friendly brownies will get you every time. Look, we painted our faces. <laughs> I can't. I love I love how Eric in this is like, oh my god. <laughs> Because that is now how I feel sometimes interacting with Mormon family, where, you know, they've got their they've got Chick-fil-A, they've got Settlers of Catan, and they have their scriptures out on the table, and everyone's singing show tunes around the around the piano, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> it feels like it feels like a scene straight out of, you know, the Andy Griffith show where everything is always happy and no problem can't ever be resolved in 30 minutes or less. In my possession, an ancient book written on gold plates. In America, really? Martin Harris was the wealthy businessman uh, that is kind of the reason the Book of Mormon exists because Joseph Smith was really poor. Emma was poor. They got Emma came from a wealthy family, but when she married Joseph Smith, because Joseph Smith already had a bad reputation for being a treasure digger, her family kicked her out. So Martin Harris is one of the few people who Joseph Smith meets who believes him and is willing to put dollar bills, you know, behind this endeavor uh, to create this 
another testament of you know this other version of the bible second bible round two bible 2.0 bible fan fiction whatever you want to call it expect to translate it with these rocks yeah, they, they do still have one of the rocks. Um, I'll include a picture here of one of Joseph Smith's peep stones. Uh, here you'll see he has a rock with a hole in it. That is also mentioned quite a bit. It seems to be that he had a few very special rocks that uh, originally he used some of these rocks to say he could find buried treasure by looking through the hole. Uh, later, he uses rocks in the translation translation of the book of mormon so we see rocks to, you know first he's using rocks to find buried treasure for people in his community he gets actually uh in trouble with the law for this this is his you know if you want to learn more about this side of joseph smith i i have a youtube video that you can watch about this whole early life of joseph smith uh but he is he's basically you know duping martin harris into giving his money to joseph so that he can translate translate the book of mormon uh and sell it so he's trying to get martin on board with the translation now when i put the seer stones into the hat the ancient letters light up and he puts his face in the hat oh my gosh oh man this for little mormon Alyssa, i would have said okay turn it off this is ridiculous that is not how joseph smith translated the book of mormon he here you know i grew up looking at so many so many so much artwork so many different depictions of this translation process little did i know that South Park is portraying my religion more correctly than my religion portrays itself. And this became such a big issue, uh, people saying, what about the hat, what about the hat, that the current prophet actually depicted this trans hat translation um, to just basically put the cards on the table and say, it's true, this is how Joseph Smith oftentimes translated the Book of Mormon. Oftentimes the plates weren't even in the room. The plates were, or they were wrapped off to the side and he put his head in the hat. Sometimes he'd put the stone in the hat. You know, he had several people help him with the translation process. So, oh man, it just like, it blows my mind a little bit that I could spend thousands of hours between church camps, early morning seminary, uh, family home evening, family scripture study, church meetings, youth meetings, and never learn this. And maybe, you know, now that President Nelson said, okay, we're going to own up to this weird fact about us. Maybe the kids, the kids these days know this, but I didn't. So it's just so, uh, it's very unnerving. Um, and obviously they are revealing a reality about Joseph Smith and his story that members don't uh members don't want to cop to also funny that the mormon girl the, her reaction does not include this this depiction of the translation she skips over it she does not react to it which is what we really wanted her to react to all along and 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 that reality that you don't know about your own religion is so scary i think i often felt like that when i was learning some of these things uh and this i did think that the ending of this mormon girl's video is very funny uh this is what she has to say about anyone in her comments trying to teach her about her own religion reaction video and um yeah leave more video ideas in the comments down below don't bother tell me what I what I believe and why my religion's wrong because you're just wasting your time and your breath, buddy. So yeah, don't waste your breath. She already knows everything that you could ever tell her. Uh, which is a common, which is another common Mormon flex is, I know the history. I know about Joseph Smith's polygamy, but I still believe. People will say, don't, why would you listen to someone who left the religion about what we believe? You should talk to me about what I believe. But the problem is, is that what you believe is what you've been spoon fed by the church and has nothing to do with real history. I would love to have somebody just go to downtown Salt Lake and interview active members and ask some of the most basic questions. How many wives did Joseph Smith have? How many wives did Brigham Young have? How long was it between 
the first vision and when Joseph Smith talked about or mentioned the first vision. It's this braggy claim that, you know, nothing, nothing that you could ever say to me would shake my faith. I don't care anything. I don't care what Joseph Smith was. I don't care what he did because I got a warm feeling in my tummy that he's a prophet. And that is the only way to know irrefutable truth is to pray and have a warm, fuzzy burning in your bosom feeling and that's just not how you know truth that's that's not uh if that's the only way i can know real hard truth and real evidence if that's the only w path then i'm happy to be a sinner i don't i if faith is the only way to prove god exists then he probably doesn't if faith is the only way to prove joseph smith was a prophet is just by praying and feeling a warm, fuzzy feeling. If that's the only proof you have to give me that this book is legitimate, sorry, that's that's not sufficient for me. And the Book of Mormon says a lot of strange stuff, like that Adam and Eve lived in Jackson County, Missouri. This is yeah, that's uh, this is also in the Book of Mormon musical because uh, there's the part there's a portion of the song where they say Adam and Eve, you know, the Garden of Eden was in Jackson County, Missouri. That's where Adam that's where Adam on Diamond is. That's where Mormons believe Jesus Christ will come again for the second coming. It's, it's all in Missouri. And, but I I love that they're portraying the dad as now just a, a believer. You know, he's playing the board game. He's throwing the dice. He's hearing claims that sound a little nonsensical and saying what's the problem with that how do you know he isn't just making stuff up and pretending he's translating off golden plates so it's pair <laughs> i <laughs> oh my gosh uh yeah so this lucy harris is very smart cookie she's basically saying if it's a true translation, then I take the original pages. Uh, he should be able to come up with the word for word, same exact thing, because if he has the source text, then he can make a second translation. And that's very smart of her. The official Mormon narrative is not that Lucy Harris uh, it took them, but that the pages were lost or stolen by evil people and then uh, then they rewrote them and changed them because they wanted to have Joseph Smith retranslate and then the evil people would catch him in the lie. Smith got mad and told Martin he needed to go pray. How is Joseph Smith going to weasel his way out of this? Let's see. He is so mad that he will never let me translate from the plate of Lehi again. <laughs> wow, amazing. So basically, Joseph Smith prays he gets a convenient revelation that God knew this was going to happen all along. And so he put the same basic teachings and story and information written by another prophet in another book. So he doesn't actually need to retranslate these pages because he's already included all the most important information in another part of the book. Yeah, Joseph Smith talks a lot about God being ang angry with him and he has a lot of like, and he has a lot of uh, convenient revelations. Like later when Joseph Smith is commanded to practice polygamy, he, uh, he says, oh, I really didn't want to do it because, you know, this is hard for me to hear, but if God commands me to do polygamy, I guess I have to. And Joseph Smith has a lot of convenient revelations that work out for him quite well, uh, that allow him to work through or work past or weasel out of the, the troubles that he finds himself in. Mormons actually know this story and they still believe Joseph Smith this is true. It, this story is very much held up as a celebration of Joseph Smith's prophethood that he, you know, had this moment with Martin Harris and they were able to and that he was able to get revelation from God about the lost pages and that everything was going to be OK. And you you really look at it at the story from an outsider perspective as, hey, he he couldn't retranslate the pages because he couldn't translate anything but mormons see this story that joseph smith told martin harris and they just they completely swallow it hook line and sinker they are it's it's just one other evidence it's just one more piece of evidence that joseph smith was who he said he really was all you've got are a bunch of stories about some ass wipe who read plates nobody ever saw out of a hat 
uh, the the Mormon girl also did not include this in her video for obvious reasons. You know, um, another another he he references uh, the proof of the Native Americans coming from Jerusalem, and prior to DNA testing in the introduction of the Book of Mormon, it did make the very bold claim that people in Jerusalem were the direct and primary descendants of the Native Americans. And after they had this DNA testing, they changed the introduction to the Book of Mormon. How does that not, even just that little fact, make people scratch their heads? They had to change the Book of Scripture to match accepted science. <laughs> that to me, and also they've never found any archaeological evidence to prove definitively that the Lamanites and the Nephites existed, all of the wars, all of all of the events that happened in the Book of Mormon never found the geography described. They've never found definitive evidence and proof that those things really happened. I guess that Mormons will just continue to say that it's true because it's if impossible to dig up every square inch of all of the Americas and dig down 50 feet. And guess what? Even if you did dig down 50 feet all across Everywhere in the Americas, Central America, South America, North America, you dug it all up down 50 feet. They would still say, well, it might be in the 51st foot. <laughs> so I like that the kid says it's a matter of faith because it is. It really is. There's no evidence. There's no real evidence. But that's how God is, too. And I'm sorry to offend my believing audience members that you, you make fun of Mormons. All religion is like that. There's no, if, if there was definitive evidence that God existed, wouldn't everyone be a Christian? Wouldn't everyone be a Jew? Wouldn't everyone be a Muslim if there was definitive evidence that was undeniable? There is not enough evidence to convincingly make it so that every single human has the same answer when it comes to if God exists, what he's like, or she uh, what manifestations he comes in, what he wants us to do with our lives, what his doctrine is. The reason that there's no definitive belief between any of them is that there's not enough evidence to compile to prove one truth. <laughs> So in this case, I am definitely on Stan's indignant team for this portion of the video. By acting like the happiest family in the world and being so nice to everyone that you just blindside dumb people like my dad. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been saying. And often on my Mormon mission, you know, who's willing to listen to Mormon missionaries is people who are sad, people who need community, people who aren't used to people spending time with them, older people, people on welfare fair people with disabilities those are often the types of people who would be willing to open the door and i don't say that unkindly i think it's it's the church preying on the people who need community the most and here they're saying dumb people i say people who are fallen on hard times uh people who don't have family members to trust people who are single moms these are the the easiest targets for Mormon missionaries because they are the people who are the most needy. And that's often who religion gets to the most quickly. Who are, it's people who are hard on their luck. It's people who need help and who look to the happy, smiling missionaries who see it's transactional. You Maybe you'll give me some help and I'll get baptized because that's what you want from me. Oh, sorry, it makes me a little... It makes me a little melancholy to think about. And maybe Joseph Smith did make it all up, but I have a great life. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's funny. He's now giving this speech because this is what I said earlier, which is how often it is that members will say, what if it isn't true? Well, it, then it gave me a beautiful life. It gave me a happy family. Uh, and so uh, honestly, if it's true or not, doesn't even matter. And, uh, you know, it's almost like there's, there's this underpinning belief in Mormonism that even if something is make believe, does it matter if it makes you a better person? And it's this kind of mind and is this kind of fantasy that I think keeps the church going for so long is they don't they don't really care about evidence. They don't care about science as much as they care about faith 
and promoting this feeling of goodness and happiness. And is that so bad? And I, I, you know, I might not say it is so bad. I might not say Mormonism is so bad if it didn't do real damage and harm. And that's the problem is that it, members only see the good because the good works for them. But it's but this is a really selfish point of view because it's saying if something works for me, then it's good, definitively good. If it works for me, I won't walk away from it, even if it's bad for other people, even if the doctrine teaches unkind, bad, horrible, racist, sexist, homophobic things about other people, if it works for me, why would I walk away? And to me, that's why the heart of Mormonism is very insidious because those who are members uh, turn a blind eye to the people who are damaged by the religion because if it works for them, where's the problem? And I find that to be sickening, honestly. Like, I definitely, I definitely think that the South Park episode about Mormons is hilarious. I'm glad it exists. I also would love to do a review on the Book of Mormon musical. Thank you for watching this video. A reminder to like this video if you enjoyed it and you want to see more content like it, subscribe. And I'm going to let some Mormon missionaries in heaven take us out. Would you like to stay for some cookies and punch? Yes, would you? Uh, no, I need to be getting back.